Hey guys, welcome to Trinity Fellowship Online. Today you're going to hear an inspiring message from our lead pastor, Pastor Darren Rogers. We hope that through this message, God speaks to you and totally illuminates his word in your life. And when he does, we want to hear about it. Send us an email to online at trinitynwa.com. You can also give online to this ministry by visiting our website at trinitynwa.com. Thank you for checking out our YouTube channel. We hope you enjoy this message. So uh, I want you to get your Bible. I want you to turn with me here in a minute. We're going to be looking at Acts chapter 2, 42, 43, 44, probably from a little bit different angle. Uh, you've heard that passage preached from before. You've heard me preach from that passage before when we were talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But I'm going to point you to something a little bit different in there this this week, uh, as far as something that I have found studying that in one of the translations of scripture that I use, that it just stood out to me that I had never noticed it that way before. Now, growing up, I was fortunate to be a part of a great family. Uh, a lot of you know my, my mom and my dad, you knew them, uh, you, you, maybe you met my sisters, I have two sisters, and, and me, there's just the five of us. And so when I was just a little kid, uh, the Lord called my dad into the ministry, and we were living out in Southern California, and dad felt the call to ministry, and he felt that call leading him to Northwest Arkansas, and so we loaded up and we moved to Arkansas, and, and our family became quite small at that time. Most of our family was still out there in the West, and we had a lot of grandparents and uncles and aunts and cousins and all. We left all them behind, and we came to Arkansas to start brand new and fresh in ministry, and we only had, I can only remember one aunt that, that I had that lived in Berryville, Aunt Sally, and she just kind of took us under her wing, and every time the tornado sirens would go off, that's not something you're used to in Southern California, so when the, the tornado sirens would go off, she'd, she would smoke a tire over to our house and her car and grab us all up, get us all together, try, try to tell us it was going to be okay, and our uh, Thanksgivings and our Christmases got a lot smaller. But we became very tight. We became very close. Became a, a really close family as a result of that. Now, I've got two sisters, as I said, and both of them are a little bit older than I am. And because of them being girls and me being a boy and them being older, we didn't have a whole lot in common. I mean, they, quite frankly, they would tell you that I was a brat. Now, that's not true, but that's what they would tell you. I was always a good kid, but... Uh, they weren't into some of the things I was into, so that's probably why I spent so much time by myself, and that's where this, this vivid imagination of mine grew out of, because when you spend a lot of time just hanging around and, and, and uh, doing things all by yourself, then that, that's what happens. And so um, even though they were girls and I was a boy, uh, we, we, uh, we, didn't, we didn't do a lot of the same things, but... We always loved each other. Now, I'm going to tell you, we didn't always like each other. But we always loved each other. And I don't know if that's the way with you and your brothers and sisters or not. That's just kind of how it was with us. And I remember one particular occasion. In fact, my sister, uh, I told her this week. I texted her and told her I was going to talk about her. And she said, okay, I'm going to be listening. So she's with us somewhere on the live stream today. I'm probably going to get a text here in a little bit telling this story about how that when we were younger, and I was probably about six or seven, uh, back then, Dad was pastoring a little small church, and uh, it was a drive, it was over in Kingston, and we lived in Berryville, and so we drove back and forth all the time from Kingston to Berryville. It was kind of a long, longer drive, especially when you're a little kid, and uh, back then, uh, Mama used to put Brill Cream, everybody say Brill Cream, some of you that have heads like mine don't need Brill Cream anymore. But back then, some of you are looking at me like Brill Cream. I don't even know what that is. Brill Cream is nasty. <laughs> Brill Cream is like, it's like lard. And Mama used to take that and she would, the only way I can make, the, the, here's what it sounded like. She put it on my head, it would go <laughs> like this. And I had hair back when I was a kid. I know you don't believe that, but I did. And so she would put that in my hair, and then she'd smear that down with a comb. And my head would be so greasy and nasty. I mean, it, was, it really was just vile. And then um, we got in the car. Of course, they, I was never allowed to sit by a door because that would have been far too dangerous for everybody in the family. So uh, sisters each had a door. I was always in the middle. And on the way home from church one night, 
Uh, I wasn't really all that tired, but I thought I'd fake it. I knew Diana had on a brand new skirt, and she liked that skirt. It was a knit, this is the 70s, so it was a knit skirt, so, you know, she wouldn't have been wearing one today, but back then it was cool, along with our white high platform shoes and our three-pronged white belts. I'm talking about this is the way it was back then. And Diana had on this new skirt, and she's sitting by the door, and I'm sitting in the middle, and I said, Mama, I want to lay down. And they said, well, there's no room for you to lay down. And so I start fake crying around. I want to lay down. And finally, Mama said, Diana, let him lay in your lap. Let him lay his head. She said, I don't want this little greasy pig laying his head on my new skirt. So I squalled and cried a little bit more. Mama said, Mama said, Diana, let him lay down. He's tired. He's your baby brother. Let him lay down on your lap. Diana glared at me and she gave me that look and I kind of grinned at her and I laid my head down in her lap and I played like I was asleep, but I tossed and turned and rolled. All the way home, I rolled and just got as much of that grease on that skirt as I could. When we got home and we got out of the car and Diana saw that skirt, I just want you to know, they didn't, they, things were different back then, and people could be beaten without the same consequences as they are now. <laughs> and that is what transpired. The beating commenced. And um, I ruined her skirt, and I, I reminded her of that this week, and she said, I'm still mad about it. I mean, it's been, I don't know, what, probably been 40-something years ago, and she said, I'm still mad about it. And, uh, and I said, you know, you should have been. You, you were right, right to be. You know, looking back on it now, I realize that I was in the wrong. But uh, that's, that's how families do sometimes, isn't it? I mean, I could tell a lot more stories. I could tell, I'm talking about her already. I'm already going to get a text. Like the time that, that, that uh, I picked at her and made her mad and she chased me into the back bathroom and nobody could hear us. Mama couldn't hear me scream and cry. So I screamed and cried for a while, and it wasn't doing any good. Diana's beating on the door. She says, you got to come out after a while. I mean, I can hear her out there breathing. She's right outside the door. She said, you're going to come out after a while. I said, no, I'm not. I'm staying here. Mom will hear me. She said, Mama's not going to hear you. She's all the way on the other end of the house. She's never going to hear you. And I thought, what am I going to do? And so I noticed the toilet brush right there in the corner. I said, I'm coming out. I heard her back up, and I opened the door. And as soon as I did, she stepped forward, and I brushed her teeth with the toilet brush. Quickly shut the door and locked it. And I heard. <laughs> and it wasn't good after that. <laughs> Families. None of y'all ever did anything like that to your brothers and sisters, I'm sure. Am I right? But now some of you probably will try. I'm, a, I'm just going to tell you right now. The toilet brush thing is not a good idea. That is not a good idea. So, even though my sisters took turns beating the fire out of me, I still love them. And as I said a few minutes ago, there were times like the toilet brush incident that we didn't all like each other, and sometimes perhaps even for days at a time. But... Some of you mamas are going, oh, wow, okay, I guess we're going to make it. I mean, this goes on in our house every day. These kids are driving us nuts. And some of you mamas are so worried because school is almost out. Like, oh, my gosh, what are we going to do? The kids are going to actually be at home. We're going to have to deal with them. And you're panicking and frantic about what that's going to look like. But yet the stories like this are give you a glimmer of hope. It's like, I think, you know, due to... I've, I've seen the pastor's sisters, and they're, they're very attractive and nice, beautiful women. And, 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 and he's sim, somewhat civilized at this point, too. So it seems as if perhaps some way that they made it. They got through. Maybe there's hope for our family as well. And there is. So when you're family, you're always family. And nothing can change that. Am I right? Nothing can change that. Because when you're family, you're just family for life. And I, I saw this verse the other day in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And it's, it's, it's in the contemporary English version, the one that I'm reading. And to my knowledge, it's the only 
Um, this is the only version that translates the word fellowship there this way. Most of the, of the passages that you use would use the word fellowship here that I'm about to read. But it carries the same connotation. And so here's what, is, here's what the verse actually said. It's, this is talking about the early church. And it said they spent their time learning from the apostles. And they were like family. That's what got my attention. They were like family to each other. They also broke bread and prayed together, and everyone was amazed by the many miracles and wonders that the apostles worked, and all the Lord's followers often met together, and they shared everything they had. Now, this is a great picture of what God intends the family of God, the church of God, to look like. Now, these are new believers that we're talking about here. They've been brought together, their common denominator being their their, their newfound belief and acceptance of Jesus Christ as their Savior. This has brought them together, and now they are forming this strange-looking family. And the only way that Paul knows to put it, most of like, most of, uh, the translations mostly say fellowship, like I said, but it, it, it carries the, the picture of family. He says, it, the only way I can describe this is that they just became like this family. Now, we all got family members uh, that are different. Am I right? And I'm not talking about black sheep. I'm just talking about weird. And yet, somehow, this new conglomeration of people from various places, even speaking different languages and different culture and heritage they bring to this one melting pot of now this new thing called Christianity. They bring all of this together and they become one family. And it's going to take a while in the New Testament for this to kind of get worked out. But here's what we see going on. The passage tells us that here there's at least four ways that what they formed uh, looked like family. They looked like family in at least four ways. And very quick, I want to I want to lay these out for you. Number one, it said that in verse forty two, it says this new family ate together. Everybody that's for eating, say amen. amen. Everybody that's for eating together, say amen. amen. And we lose a few, perhaps. Some of the introverts would just as soon have you stay at your table. And that's why it got quiet right there. The extroverts are like, well, that's not very nice. And the introverts were like, amen. <laughs> amen. Go ahead, Pastor, preach it. So, um, but how many stories can you tell about uh, family dinners, like family reunions and, mem and memories of getting together with family? Eating is a good thing, and it always brings people together. And it is actually a lot more fun when families do this together. You know, um, no different in the church. It's no different in the church. I love it when the church gets together and, and the potlucks and all that kind of stuff. Uh, those, are, those are fun days, fun times. Some people aren't into that. They're like, I'm not going to eat all that. I don't know where it's been. But, you know, we, we, just, we go by the verse of Scripture that said that they could eat any deadly thing and it would not hurt them. You know, we, we pray over it and then we just, you know, wait and watch the clock for six or eight hours. And if we don't get sick, then it was a good day. You know, and so... And so you know, we, we used to have these things at the church when we were, at, uh, dad was pastoring in, in uh, Batavia over there by Alpena and Harrison. And I don't know, some of you might, might have heard me tell this story, but it is so, it, it's still ingrained in my mind. I tell it because I can't get away from it, you know. It, it's, not, it's one of those things that's, that you wish you could forget, but you can't. And so we would have these church dinners over there at Batavia, and they would be on Sunday morning after church. And I can remember how me and the other kids when, right when dad would get ready to say, he, we knew he was praying. We knew amen was coming. And we would, as soon as he said amen, we would tear out of that place, run as fast as we could to get in line first at the church dinner. And it wasn't because the food was so great. It's because Uncle Jim was at the church dinner in his overalls with his big wooden spoon. And he would walk down the table eating out of each plate as he went. Instead of putting it on his plate, 
He'd just sample out of each thing as he went down the table. And all of us kids were like, don't get behind Uncle Jim. Do whatever you got to do to get ahead of Uncle Jim. This is one of the things that families do. They eat together. They, 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 there's fellowship that takes place in that kind of a setting that doesn't really happen anywhere else. It just breaks down walls. And so the early church, as a family... They ate together. Number two, it says in verse 42, that they prayed together. And what a blessing that is for us to know that, that we have people uh, that are part of our church family, not just immediate family, but we have people part of our church family that are concerned enough about us that every time we voice a need, we know they're praying for us. Isn't that amazing to have people that you know? Uh, scripture talks about us bearing one another's burdens. And isn't it great to know that, that when you share with your church family that they don't just say, yeah, whatever. But there's people that are actually out there praying for you. They're caring about you. And in turn, you do the same. That's what families do. We're in this life together. You know, there's something that I'm going to tell you, probably the most serious thing I'll say this morning. Some days I get real serious, some days I don't. This is the most serious thing I'm going to tell you this morning. None of us are going to make it out of this life alive. That's about the most serious thing I can tell you. In Arkansas, ain't none of us going to get out of this thing alive. This life going to kill every one of you. Unless Jesus comes during our lifetime, we get raptured. But if he doesn't, we hope he does. We think he will. But if he doesn't, none of us are going to make it out of this alive. And that means that we're going to have struggles and problems and tests and trials and heartache and hardship and grief and tragedy. We're going to deal with those things just like everybody else does. But what's going to help us through it? You say, Jesus, obviously Jesus. And also what's going to help us through that? Our family. Our family that's praying for us, that's sticking with us, that's standing with us, that's not judging us. Our family that's hanging with us. Number three, it's said in verse 44 that they were like family because they, they met together. We need to meet together like we're doing right now. It's good to get together. Sometimes it's hard to find the time to get together, but, that, but it's worth the struggle to make it happen. I think that's why Sundays are so special. Because it's the one day a week that everybody can pencil in the same time and say, we're going to lay fishing aside. I hope, nobody, I hope nobody went fishing today. I know you didn't because you're here, but don't, don't tell the one that went fishing. He'll be mad at me now. You're going to lay fishing aside. You're going to lay whatever it might be. If it's not vacation, you're laying those things aside, and you're committing to being in the house of the Lord with other people on that day. Amen? It's important that we meet together, but we're busy people. We're very, very busy, and I get that. There are a lot of things that come up. Sometimes people just have to work. They can't help it. There are things that happen. There are people that aren't here today because they're in the hospital. Obviously, they weren't going to be here today. I mean, there's a lot of things that happen, and I get that, but it's tough sometimes for us to meet together. It's why, that's why it's important that when we have opportunities like this, everybody knows on Sunday, I told somebody the other day, I said, the only thing in our church that is a constant after 25 years, the only thing at our church that doesn't change is this. Everything else is going to change. But what doesn't change is this. We're going to have church on Sunday morning. Sometime we're going to have church on Sunday morning. It's that time that we meet. It's that time that we get together. And some people are just too busy and they won't do it. Even family members won't get I mean, you can call a family reunion. Tell them a year in advance they still wouldn't show up. It's like a story I heard about uh, this, this elderly couple who really wanted their son and their daughter and their grandchildren to come and visit them. But they lived far away and they would never come. So finally the dad had an idea. He got on the phone and he called his son Bob. And he said, Bob, I've had it with your mother. We're done. 45 years of being married to her is all I can take. And he said, I'm going to tell you something, son. We're getting a divorce. She's sick of me. I'm sick of her. We're done. Call your sister and tell her I said it. And he hangs up the phone. Bob gets on the phone, called his sister in Boston. Dad, just call me. Mom and dad are getting a divorce. We got to do something. The sister says, I'll take care of it. She gets on the phone and she calls dad. She says, hey, Bob just called me. He said, y'all about to get a divorce. She said, let me tell you something. We're on our way there. Don't you do nothing till we get there tomorrow. And the dad said, all right. He hung up the phone. He turned to his wife and he said, there you go. Both of them will be here tomorrow with their families and they're paying their own way here.
Number four, it said they shared together. Verse 44, they shared together. Now, this, sometimes your family members, even in the church, they want to share too much. You know what I'm talking about? There's some, so, sometimes, sometimes we don't hear from some of the family until they want us to share with them some more. You know what I'm, what I'm talking about? So, um, yeah, I know some of you know what I'm talking about. So, um, I got an idea for you. I figured out a way to solve the issue of family members who come to your house that you don't want them to keep coming. Family members that just keep coming. All right, here's what you do. You ready? Get it out, write it down. This is going to work. You got people that keep coming around and you don't want them to and you can't figure out how to get rid of them. Here's what you do. Borrow money from the rich ones and loan it to the poor ones. And you won't see the one I'm thinking for a long time. Think about that for a minute. Some of you, I was like, what? In about five minutes, somebody start. Oh, that's, I get that now. Borrow money from the rich ones and loan it to the poor ones. And then the rich ones would be mad because you didn't pay them back. And the poor ones would be dodging you because they don't want to have to answer to where it's at. So, that's not what this is talking about. When it says they shared together, it's not talking about socialism or communism. It just means they cared enough to look out for each other. They weren't giving handouts to half-steppers. That's not what's going on. But they're helping each other through the struggle, struggles that life presents. They're sharing happily. They're sharing happily. I know you're writing that down. There's four things that they did. So while you're writing that down, I'm, I'm about to wrap this up. But I, I'm going to tell you a story about how families share. How families should share. So a um, couple been married about 50 years down at a local Burger King. They go in and they order one meal. Only one meal. And they go to the booth, they sit down, and the, uh, grandpa takes the napkin and he sets one here and he puts one down for grandma and then she gets out a knife and she cut the burger right in half. And then they split the fries and they got two glasses and, and they poured the Coke and they got half a Coke in each one. There's a man sitting in the next booth and he says, he said, I couldn't help, help but notice, you know, he said, I, I'm not trying to get in your business, but he said, I would love to buy you guys another meal. And she said, oh, no, 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 it's not like that. It's not that we don't have the money. She said, we've been married 50 years, and we just decided way back then that we were going to split everything right down the middle. That's just how we're going to do. And while they're talking, the man begins to eat. And so he notices that the lady, she just folds her hands and puts them in her lap. And she's just sitting there. She's not eating her food. She's just sitting with her hands in her lap. And so he's, he's curious. He's like, well, okay, I get the, the, the sharing thing, but... Are you not going to eat? She said, yes. He says, just like I told you. She said, we share everything. We decided we we're going to share everything right down the middle. And she said, today it's his turn to use the teeth first. <laughs> now that sounds like family to me. Right? That's what you call true fellowship. When you're sharing the teeth. I don't know that God intended us to share the teeth. But he did intend for us to share true fellowship. And in order to do that we need to know each other. We're family. And when you look around this room you're going to see a lot of people today that you probably don't know. It's true. But in this room is represented so many good people. With a vast amount of love and knowledge and resources and ability to help each other along the way. And we need to learn to know each other. We should probably be wearing name tags right now, but everybody hates it. Name tag Sundays, we used to do them. I'm not opposed to it now. It's just you only get about half the people to do it, and the other ones are too ashamed to put their name on their shirt. <laughs> My name is Darren, but I don't want anybody to know. And so... We're not wearing name tags, but we ought to be. We need to get to know each other. We need to know each other. Last story. We might get out early. This thing ain't even supposed to start over there till 12, and it's only 11.15. I think it's going to start early. But we need to get to know each other. And so my last story, and then we'll pray, is about... 
a little mama, a young mother, 25, 26 years old. She had a little four-year-old daughter. And she was getting her down for the night to go to bed. And so the little girl's laying in bed and mama's sitting on the bed beside her. And they've talked stories and they've prayed. And they've done all the stuff they do. And then the mama just begins to reminisce about what life was like for her when she was a little girl. And so she said to her daughter, oh, it was so much fun. She said, we lived in the country and and we had a farm and we had a pond and because it was up north, it used to get so cold in the winter that the pond would freeze over and we would ice skate on the pond. And then she said, in the summer, she said, we had a tire swing and hung under the big tree And oh, we had so much fun on that swing. And we had a pony. We rode a pony. And then in the summertime, we would go pick wild raspberries in the woods. And the little girl pushed on her. She said, oh, oh, I wish I would have gotten to know you so much sooner. (laughs) Mama was a lot more fun 20 years ago. (laughs) And all the mamas said, amen. Amen. I wish I would have gotten to know you so much sooner. How much did we miss out on because we didn't get to know each other so much sooner? The word today says we're like family. And we need to get to know each other. We need to have these things in common. I'm glad you're here today. I'm so glad to see all of you. I appreciate you being here. As we enter into this, what we're calling this season of connection, though, it's not just about moving two services to one, but there's actually a method to our madness. Our goal is, for however long we're able to do this, I don't know how long we'll be able to make this happen um, for space-wise and parking and children and all. I don't know how long we'll be able to be together. I don't know. Weeks? I don't know. I, I don't know how long it'll last. Months? I don't know. However long this season can last. Take advantage of the opportunity that you have right now to get to know your family. And so today what's going to happen, we're going to roll in over here and we're going to eat hamburgers and we're going to have a great time. It's a normal thing for us to kind of group together with either biological family or close friends. We're not trying to be cliquish. I'm not even saying you can't do that. Set your tent up out there and have a great time. All I'm asking you to do though is let's just all be inclusive. Let's all be thinking about the tent next to us. Let's be thinking about the kids that are playing over there. I want you to use this time today to just walk around and get to know folks. Just And you say, well, I've only been coming a short time, Pastor. I feel really weird because I've only been coming here two or three weeks or two or three months. I feel really weird. I know a lot of people have been here a long time. It don't matter. Nobody here really knows how long the other guy's been here. It doesn't matter. None of that matters. You're here today. You're here now. It's your family now. So walk around and make it your goal to meet as many people as you can. Greet as many people as you can. Get to know as many people as you can. Because these are the folks that you're going to do life with here until we get to heaven. And then they might be your next door neighbor when we get to glory someday. Who knows? Some of you are like, well, I got five or six on a list right now. If the Lord puts them next to me, I'm going to be really, really mad. I don't want them to go to hell, but I want them to live on the other end of town. I don't want to run into them. I'm glad they're there. I just don't want to know it. So hopefully you don't know anybody like that in this church that you have those feelings about. Get to know each other. Spend time together. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for bringing us together. I thank you for your presence that we have sensed, Lord, in the worship and in the prayer time. I praise you that you give us the opportunity to study the word together in this atmosphere of freedom, liberty. Let the word sink into our spirit, Acts 2, 42 through 45. We are like family. Help us to get this in our spirit this week and understand that responsibility and obligations that come with being a part of a family help us to commit to that and to each other Lord I pray right now if there be somebody in this room who's not in the family not because they don't want to be they just they just never thought about her they never made the choice to become a member of the family 
Lord, would you convict their heart right now? Would you convict their heart right now and give them the courage to make a change in their life? To say, you know what? I, I want to have the joy of the Lord. I want to live for Jesus. I want my life on earth to change. And I want to follow Jesus the rest of my life. I want to go to heaven.